University in California. Welcome to our show today. Michael, over to you. Thanks so much, Carolina. It's a pleasure today to have uh, two uh, great educators I, I consider friends. And uh, uh, of course, I'm always jealous of them because uh, whenever we speak, uh, they're out on the West Coast. Randy's out on the West Coast of British Columbia. And during the course of the, uh, the winter, uh, I'm always asking him what it's like. And he's telling me that it's, oh, yeah, it's 50 degrees. And, oh, I think the tulips are already starting to show a little bit. And, and of course, Michael, uh, uh, being in Turo, is just a little, uh, a little north of San Francisco in the Wine Valley area. And so I'm always jealous because I, I love Californian wines. So uh, uh, I feel very privileged to have them with us today. Um, as uh, Carolina just mentioned, uh, these are two individuals who've been working in the, in the field of online education for, for many, many years. Um, they've provided uh, invaluable resources to our community. Um, and I'd like to really um, pick their, their, their brains and get a, an idea from them as to what really is happening in, across Canada, um, maybe in the United States as well and worldwide, what's happening in the world of online education, especially as we're in this uh, pandemic uh, environment. But let me start with a very practical question. First of all, uh, every year the President of the United States goes before Congress and he does the State of the Nation. Um, but we have our own State of the Nation here in Canada. And maybe, uh, uh, Michael, you could tell us a little bit more about what uh, uh, the, uh, the State of the Nation actually is here in Canada. That's for our first question. Perfect. Yep. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, essentially, we are a, uh, I guess for the last 13 years now, we have been doing an annual study that looks at the level of participation and the nature of regulation of um, K-12 distance online and blended learning across the country. So what we um, try to do is go province by province, territory by territory, as well in the last I guess it's been about seven or eight years now. We also have a federal profile as well for our uh, First Nations, um, Métis and Innu, um, or Inuit, sorry, um, uh, schools, or Indigenous schools, and looking at essentially how much activity is happening when it comes to various forms of, of distance learning in each of the provinces and territories. and. Um, what, um, you know, how that, that's governed at the ministerial level by either legislation or regulation. Thanks, Michael. Can you, maybe uh, either of you, Randy or Michael, tell us that over the 13 years, have you seen much of an evolution with, uh, 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 in e-learning across Canada? Um, Randy? Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> Put up hands. I'm a, I'm a good student in school. Sorry, I'm not in school. I'm in a car. So, <laughs> um, so what I think is really important that's, that's created a seen a shift is in the early years, um, the hundred year experience that we've had or more across Canada in terms of distance education, we've evolved from just a simply correspondence content driven model to one that it, it creates more engagement and, and trying to get into the social emotional. So I've seen a lot of programs that started and teachers that started with trying to put content, just content together and have some level of interaction around assignments. But a lot of programs have started to shift towards more of a blended uh, approach in that they are taking advantage of having students come in one, two days a week into the school building in order to have go through some problems, issues that they had with the, the, the content and the materials, what it is that they're working with, but also to build sort of a project and a, a connection or to do assessment about some of the learning that sort of remote situation. So class is online, but a lot of physical contact and connections are created in and around the program. So those that were strictly bringing teachers into a central spot and then broadcasting don't really, they're, they're, they're still good and they still fill a role and a niche for that, but where students can come together with teachers. That is here, Mike, uh, Randy. Sorry, the beauty of mobile. I'm going, to, I'm going to stop you because you're breaking up just a little bit. Um, on, and again, on that particular point, as we look at across what's happening across Canada and you look at the state of the nation, um, are there provinces that have more legislation? Are they, is it more anchored or embedded in uh, the educational system than other provinces? I can take that one since I know Randy's having connectivity issues. 
Um, in terms of legislation, BC and Nova Scotia are probably the two that have the most legislation. Uh, BC has a, a specific clause in its um, Schools Act, as well as its Independent Schools Act, that relates to what they term distributed learning, and then have a whole policy framework that um, stems from that legislation. In the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually built into the collective agreement that they have with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, which is, uh, in order to come into force, has to be passed into law. So. Um, there's a section of that that right now I think has about 15 individual clauses that sort of govern how uh, online learning or distance education is the term they use there um, would work. And in that case, it's mostly dealing with uh, how the role of teachers and, you know, work life things, things you would expect to find in a collective agreement. Have you found any correlation between the, the amount of legislation and the general acceptance by the educational community um, of e-learning? Because I'll cite, for example, in Quebec, we're late to the, to the, uh, the table, um, and we have basically no legislation or, or regulations tied to this. Um, so how is the community and legislation, is there any correlation between the two, you, or have you seen any? Um, not a great deal. Um, I can say, and, and your observation I think is correct, those areas where there isn't much in the way of either legislation or regulation, in most cases tend to be the, the provinces and territories that have less activity. Having said that, if you look at the two that have the most activity from a proportional perspective, uh, both Alberta and BC have about 10% of their students um, as of last school year that have, we're taking one or more courses online. BC is very, you know, has a, a lot of legislation and regulation. Alberta has, at least at the time, pretty much none. Um, mm -hmm. So you had really two opposite extremes, but yet they were both having similar levels of participation. Mm -hmm. That's really and, interesting. And, uh, uh, ahead, jump in on the question. Um, it's really legislation or policy is not really the directive towards practice. It's the funding that uh, brings to the practice, but there, BC has gone through a series of terrible relationships within uh, their secondary schools, for example, with their online programs, but they worked hard to integrate them. Now secondary school programs and districts are working collectively with e-learning as a part of that portion of their entire district portfolio. But it's taken a struggle over the last number of years to actually make it a district integrated program and be recognized. But the policy and the legislation in that period of time has never changed. That's interesting. Okay, okay um, perfect. Do you want to go on to the next question? Yeah, let me go question on to the, the next yeah. question here. Um, uh, am I reading this, uh, Caroline? Or yeah, I, sure, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. Um, where do you anticipate e-learning is headed and what technologies will drive this change? Who wants to jump in and try that one, uh, Randy, Michael? Um, where are we headed with e-learning and or uh, online education? I, even the terms we're, we're struggling with, I think. But uh, there, where there, are we there was there was a good article that was done, and I think uh, in our partners uh, in digital learning to the south. And there's an argument for an increase, an argument solidly as well against an increase and a turn away from e-learning because of the remote learning experience that people are having. But I'm with the sense that. I think this is an anomaly in what has been a continued growth. I think there is a larger, obviously, awareness now. And I think it's up to us in, in sort of in the e-learning um, networks that we're in to keep pushing that forward because I think we have a window of opportunity to make it a more important part. So my vision is that teachers should be using the online learning environment just as well as they use the classroom learning environment for the maximum they can get from either of those two, but they should be used together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, what do you think? Um, well, I'll, I'll be a little less diplomatic than Randy and I'll take one specific side on this. Um, as much as we've seen teachers do some wonderful things over the past few months with incorporating online content and using online tools to continue to you know, have some continuity of instruction with their students, um, the second that we have achieved herd immunity um, with a, a vaccination on this thing, I honestly believe that 90% of the folks will go back to whatever it was they were doing in February. 
Um, I think there are some teachers and some schools and some districts that were sort of already on that tipping point. And the experience at the end of this school year, and I'm going to say for all of next school year, because I think it is something that you're going to experience for the entire 2021 school year. Um, I don't think it's just the beginning of the fall. I think that, you know, it'll be June to July, maybe even August of next year before um, things start to return to normal. Um, but those that were on the tipping point, I think that that 18 months will be enough to push them over and you'll see some wonderful things. Um, for those that weren't close to the tipping point, I think you'll see them dig in even more about their resistance to this kind of instruction. Yeah. Um, I'd like to delve into that a little more. Like what's, what's at the heart of this resistance to uh, online learning? Is it simply that it's new, it's different, it challenges them? Um, what do you think is really uh, behind this, uh, this uh, fear, if you want, of, of online uh, distance education? I think there's a, a number of things, and I think you've mentioned a couple of them. Um, one of the things that I think that folks in, in my realm really have dropped the ball on, and that's at the university level, is, you know, teachers haven't been prepared to do this. You know, you you take a, you know, use yourself as an example before you got into you know this this uh, you know into learn into this realm michael um you know you would have had 13 years of experience as a student where you would have been in a traditional classroom-based environment then you would have had four or five years as an undergrad student probably in much the same fashion your teacher education program would have taught you how to uh, you know trained you how to teach in a classroom environment, how to assess in a classroom environment. Your master's probably did roughly the same thing. My guess is that the first time that you probably experienced anything when it came to, to e-learning or online learning were things you sought out yourself because of a personal experience you had, oftentimes with your children or grandchildren, it seems. Um, or I know in your case, when you were doing your doctorate, because I know that's what your, your doctorate focused upon. Um, you know, we really haven't done a good job at preparing teachers for this. And in much the same way that if I were to ask you to go do something that you hadn't been prepared to do in front of, you know, 30 spectators, which is really what the students are in this kind of situation, you'd be reluctant to do it too, without any, any practice. Yeah. So human nature, go ahead, Randy. I'm going to take the Pollyanna view, which is great. I love playing off of you, Michael. And I, I'm not disagreeing with you. But I think as well that being thrust into this and having a whole year of it, what I have seen with the teachers I've been working on in the past couple of months is they are actually embracing how to use the technology to create that learning space that's constant for all of their learners so that they are using the technology base as their, their, their classroom, their palette or their, their, their situation. And they're integrating then what they do in the classroom differently. I have seen some move and some shift, but I'm also dealing with the, the early adopters, those that will take charge and do this. And I think those are the ones we need to flag and then help them to help their colleagues along in this situation. It's an opportunity to get people immersed in what digital learning technologies can do and then ask the question. So again, gentlemen, the second half of that question, and I, I pushed you maybe a little bit into the direction where it was going, but, but we have some big players um, in, in, the, in terms of technology. We've got Google, we've got Microsoft, Zoom. Um, uh, what role do you think they're going to play in driving the direction that, that uh, online education takes? And will it be a good thing or a bad thing, Randy? <laughs> I, I hope none. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, Randy is right, though. I mean, essentially what... The only thing the tools allow us to do essentially is create a more seamless environment. So, you know, the easier the tools become in general, the easier it is for teachers just to go in and do what they were doing in the classroom. It's one of the reasons why you saw synchronous tools, regardless of which one they chose, have such an adoption during a lot of this remote instruction because it was the closest thing to that stand and deliver kind of mode in the classroom, you know, and as these tools become easier to use and allow us to do more and more, it's going to allow teachers to continue to do the innovative things that they do from a, 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 a pedagogical standpoint 
And, you know, but it's the pedagogy that's going to drive a lot of this innovation, not necessarily the tools. In an ideal situation, the tools will eventually become invisible uh, to us. Yeah. Exactly. And your question was a little bit loaded, Michael, and to drive the direction. We do not want technology to drive the direction. Pedagogy drives it. And what we want is all of those partners and players, you know, the LMSs and others and Microsoft and Google to line up, help us, show, teach us how to use your tools, but don't tell us what to do with them. <laughs> I agree. Hey, wrong question two, and we got to keep moving. So. Yes, so we'll go to question three. What innovative approaches are other provinces and countries implementing or planning to manage K-12 education in this pandemic? Well, and again, I, I'm glad to pass it to, to uh, Michael and or uh, Randy because they have an opportunity to see things from a, a, a higher perspective, a like bird's eye view on things. And uh, um, as they see everything going on across Canada and in the United States and elsewhere, I'm wondering if they've seen things that were particularly uh, um, striking for them. Randy, you've got I got, I'm just going to jump in to say that I've kind of already said what I've seen in some pockets of innovation. So I'll let Michael take the lead on this. <laughs> Michael? Yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, sorry, window popped up there asking me to unmute myself after I had already unmuted myself. Um, I, I think one of the things that I've seen um, not just internationally, but in some jurisdictions in Canada, over the, the past few months, those areas that I think have been able to sort of leap into this remote instruction or, you know, using these online tools the most uh, seamlessly are those that already had sort of centralized tools. And when I say centralized, I don't necessarily mean centralized at the provincial level. It could be centralized at the district level. You know, the district has an established LMS or the district has decided that, you know, for our video-based discussions, we are going to use X because what ended up happening was all of the teachers and all of the students already had some familiarity with it and, and they were all using a common tool. It wasn't that you were using Flipgrid and I was using voice threads and Randy was using the discussion form that's inherent in the LMS. And, you know, um, you know, poor Carolina has got three kids and we're all teaching them. So now she's got to support three different video based discussions. You know, so those that had that common set of tools, and who already had a, a set of curriculum put together. And, and in most cases, this was at the provincial level, a couple at the district level, um, but curriculum that was already available to them that was aligned to whatever the outcomes for their, their particular subject area were. Those I think have really made the transition quite easily because it allowed teachers to focus upon, you know, as we were talking the last time, okay, now how do I use this? You know, thinking about the students that I have, you know, and, and what their needs are and what their strengths and weaknesses are. How can I leverage all of this stuff? Whereas folks that didn't have those centralized tools and that centralized content, they had to spend a lot of time finding what to use, learning how to use it, you know, seeking out resources, making sure that they were okay and approved and, you know, had appropriate privacy settings for whatever it was needed for, you know, based on the laws of their jurisdiction. Um, so, and, and I've seen that in several different, um, you know, states in the U.S., several provinces, and a couple of other countries as well, where they already had this system in place. Yeah, and I think anecdotally, I think it would be interesting to go back and do some research on it. But I think in those places, people will reflect back on the pandemic era as being okay. But whereas in others where they didn't have centralized opportunities, some centralized training and approaches, they're going to find it was a bad era, and they're going to jump right back into the classroom and just take all those tools and go, forget it. I think uh, what you're saying is really interesting because uh, at a recent uh, Can You Learn board meeting, I was listening to people in other provinces saying how um, once everything went online, they were ready to go and, uh, and it went uh, from being uh, mildly chaotic to fairly well organized. And uh, to be honest with you here in Quebec, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, um, as Michael was suggesting, we have uh, teachers who are saying, well, what platforms do I use? What tools? Where do I go? There was no uniformity in there. But I also like the other point that I think was like being nuanced in there is that where there's already good pedagogy going on, you know, integrating a good uh, online uh, uh, skills uh, seems to, uh, to follow through. Is that a fair assessment of what you're saying? 
Yeah. Okay. We're getting nodding of heads and because uh, I, I got, not everyone sees you, so I have to say okay. We're getting to, Michael and Randy going. Yes, that's that's a fair assessment. Yes. Right. Does that help? <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Carolina. Can we move so, on? To yeah. Sure. Four? Question number four. So what teacher training is being planned for in other provinces or that you would re recommend? And again, Michael, yeah. this touches on what you said a second ago. So uh, Randy, why don't you jump yeah, in? Let, let me jump in. I think it's, it's very early to answer that question in the sense that everyone is working out the plans. Um, because it, but it, at this point in time, I, my assessment of what's happening in all the schools and the systems is that people are exhausted. They have managed to get through this. And for many teachers in particular, if you're going to ask them how you're going to plan to, to do this again in September, they're going to go, no. <laughs> I mean, most teachers have younger children, those that are younger. I mean, and so they, they've had to teach in the middle of that with possibly a spouse or someone else in the household working. Uh, so it, it's completely disrupted everything. So it was survival. And people have gone into survival and they made it to June. I think to ask now, what is the plan? I think it needs to pause, take a breath. And there, and I see plans starting to be put into place for August. But again, because each district has uh, and, and jurisdiction has some responsibility for this, the plans are very specific to their what they have, the resources, the approaches that they find as a commonly. So it will be a bit of a smorgasbord come September in every single spot. Michael, what do you think? Well, just to build on that, I mean, I think Randy's right. Like, here's the California one here, you know, a guidebook for safe reopening of California's public schools. And I would say for every sentence that's in there, there's three questions. <laughs> and those questions are, you know, here's some of the things you've got to figure out. And, and, and you know, what works, you know, here in the Bay Area, uh, where, you know, we've got Silicon Valley just dropped in is not going to work, you know, up in, in Grass Valley, up in the Sierra Nevadas, um, where, you know, internet access is a challenge. And I, th I think that's going to be the difficulty at this point. Uh, and trying to figure out what training is required is really going to be a, a challenge for school leaders, but it's a challenge that they've got to figure out now because that training has got to then be planned in the next, say, six weeks so that essentially the month of August is going to be when, um, you know, the rubber is going to meet the road when it, it comes to those things. And it's not just uh, something that falls upon the schools. I mean, this is, you know, we while the immediate crisis has passed, this is still, you know, we are still in a pandemic. This is still an emergency situation. We still need to triage some of what's happening and we can't go about business as normal. You know, teachers unions are going to need to engage actively in the process. And, you know, any union leader that says that, well, the school year starts on this and our contract says we start X number of days before the, the school year starts. Well, that's just not going to fly right now. Um, you know, the definition of a school day and all those kind of things, some of which is legislated. In fact, it's funny because the, the very first paragraph of the this document says, openly admits, we know that the legislation prevents a lot of what we're suggesting from happening. We'll take care of that before the school year starts. You know, that's what the Department of Education here has said. Yeah. You know, so I, there's, there's still so many moving parts at this point that I think it's, it's difficult to plan and say, we need training on X or Y. I think right now it's a matter of we need training. It's got to happen at least by this date so that folks can have a chance to prepare and play and learn, um, you know, the, the tools and, and, and the strategies. And beyond that, uh, I think, you know, there's not much more we can plan at this and, stage. And I think it's context, context, context. All good educators can make something happen with what they have at hand. So you first have to decide what you have at hand and do students have access to it? And how do you get them access? All of those are fundamental questions. When they all walk into my classroom, hey, they're there. I've got them self-contained. So it's what resources I can bring into that common space. But they're not there. They're going to be out and about. And so how do I connect them with what's needed? So if I'm in northern Quebec, uh, where the Internet is a, is a huge issue, and most families in, in homes don't have some level of Internet, they might have a cell phone. Um, 
So how do I connect with them? Very differently than I would in high-speed uh, Montreal or Laval. And one of the things that came out yesterday in the workshop we had with over 100, about 155 teachers yesterday was exactly that high, high level of anxiety going into being ready for September. What am I going to do? We had many questions. Uh, well, how am I going to prepare? How am I going to do all this? And I think what you're both saying is that at the end of the day, everything falls on the teacher because they're the ones in the classroom. They're the ones interacting with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the students and uh, they've got to figure it out as best they can. And yeah, you're right. There's no shortage of resources being thrown at them, but maybe sometimes a lack of coherence. Yeah, and I think one of the things school leaders need to do at this point is to help streamline some of that. Um, you know, if, if I was a, a leading a school district right now, one of the first things I would be looking at is, OK, let's come up with an established list of tools for, you know, different grade levels or maybe across the system so that, you know, we've got a common set of tools so that everyone is using, you know, these five programs or these eight programs. Um, you know, because then I can start to train folks on those five or eight programs. I know that if I'm having trouble as a teacher with one of those programs, you're using the same kind of program. So I can call you up and say, you know, Michael, how the hell do I do this? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm lost here. Um, you know, the other thing that I think departments could be doing right now, you know, we've had a very significant disruption in this school year. And, and if departments aren't doing it, districts need to do it. You know, there are, the term they use here in the U.S. is power standards. You know, there are certain curricular objectives that your Department of Education or your ministry has laid out that students, you know, that students in grade three math need to know in order to be able to perform in grade four math. And there are some curriculum outcomes in there that were put in there because they were age appropriate and we thought they were important for well-rounded educated citizens. Mm -hmm. I want to know what's needed for grade four so that I can make sure my students have those things. And if they don't, I can remediate that in the first couple of weeks of September. Mm -hmm. And that's something I haven't seen a lot of school leaders um, at the, the either the ministry level or at the district level doing saying, you know, here are the critical standards that we want to make sure students get. And here's the things that, you know, it's, it's nice if we can get to these things, but if we don't, well, I'm sure they'll pick them up along the way. And even if they don't pick them up along the way, it's not going to be critical in the end. Yeah. So it's in the interest in, in Quebec instance, then it's the core competencies that are there for, for students. And sometimes they're very in the social emotional kind of levels. They're not in, in the sort of the typical standard way we, we think in terms of schooling. Excellent. All right, I'm going to uh, keep Michael, we have some uh, comments that came oh, in okay. uh, for Please our go. two, yeah, our two previous yes. questions. So, uh, question number two: Where do you anticipate e-learning is headed, and what technology? So, we have here a reply. I think this brings emergency remote teaching has forced some teachers to try new technology and strategies. I think this will help drive e-learning forward, more so than technology. Pure necessity. Um, and then we received another reply for the, our, our third question, which is with the innovative approaches. Um, I agree with uh, Michael Barber that the pre-existing use of common tools certainly helped, but school level teamwork made the difference for schools that transitions most, most successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we have another comment here. Agreed, I personally have never used Google Meet or Zoom until we were forced into distance learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, your comments and thank you for uh, joining the uh, eLearn uh, Ed Chat. Uh. And again, it, it all seems to reflect, you know, we did a little poll yesterday and we said, well, how many of you, uh, talking to the educated teachers, how many of you are ready for September? And I think it was about 13, 12, 13% approximately, which is again, the typical uh, cohort that we see here, the, the grouping of, of teachers or the early adopters and they're ready and they're keen. And yeah, maybe they were driven by necessity, but they are already for, ready to move forward. But then we had so many questions that come back to what uh, Michael and Randy were mentioning is that, what about, I'm now teaching grade four and I'm, I'm an elementary school teacher. How am I gonna do this online? And, and then other very specific questions, uh, I have special needs students. How do I deal with them online? What do I do here? Randy? And, and how do I do both care for kids at a distance online plus the ones that are in front of me? Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, I, I want to keep moving to our next yep. question, Carolina. Question number five. What does the research tell us that students need to be successful in an online environment? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, who wants to tackle this one <laughs> in in uh, uh, 240 characters or less? I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, both Randy and I, you might not be able to see all the videos. Both Randy and I are smiling at that that question because we both know that um, while the practice of K distance education at the K-12 level has been around for over 100 years and online learning has been used for between 25 and 30 now, the amount of research that's been done into it is still quite small. And um, there's not a lot of things that we can say definitively. Uh, there are a number of things that, you know, we would probably classify as promising practices. Um, and uh, the one that right now I think is, is probably if, if folks were to read one thing and one thing only, it would be the, um, the academic communities of engagement framework that Jared Borup has come up with. And I'll send the link out in the ed chat when Randy starts talking here in a sec. Um, but essentially, it, it's a framework that looks at how we can engage students so that they can have success, not just in the online environment, but in the whole school environment. And, you know, the online setting affords certain things and it presents certain challenges in much the same way that the classroom affords certain things and also presents some challenges. And, and the way the framework is designed, it looks at, you know, how we can use the physical space and the community and home resources, as well as the instructional resources that a teacher can bring to the table and how different settings and different mediums and different tools need to leverage different aspects of those sort of different realms to allow the student to have success. And it's a really interesting and I think innovative approach to looking at it. Very much so. And, and what I'm going to say is the first thing is there is no such thing as digital natives. OK, um, students, we assume know how to understand technology. They don't. What you I mean? OK, so they're born and there's, they're born around with cars. So does that mean they know how to drive them? No, I think there's some specific training and that needs to happen for students. But to be successful right now in the way a lot of e-learning programs are operated, Students require some level of self-motivation, intrinsically or extrinsically motivated to do so, but they have to be student-driven. The other thing is there has to be support for all students, and depending on the age of the learner, the varying degrees of each are required, but I think that those are two fundamental components. Those students that choose and are uh, thrive in e-learning are because they want to do that. Those that don't are because they are recalcitrant to do that. And we all know we've had those students in our classrooms and not been very successful either. Mm -hmm. So uh, Randy, what I'm gathering here, it's really, if, you're, if they're not going, if they're not motivated in the regular brick and mortar setting, they're not gonna be motivated in an online setting. Um, uh, how, but do you think maybe that the online setting offers certain opportunities that they might not have in a regular classroom? Or do you think the setting might in certain mm -hmm. cases work for them that uh, brick and mortar might not serve. There are many learners that move and gravitate to the online programs because of issues in socializing, anxiety, uh, all of that cramming these rambunctious hormone driven children, sorry, I was a secondary teacher, uh, <laughs> into this crammed space and not having them feel anxious and concerned. There's a whole bunch of those things. And so migrating outside of that to somewhere where they can pace it differently. Um, even autistic children are more successful in a well-structured online program uh, than we've seen in, in if they're put into a classroom. With, you know, but either way, students need supports. You just can't throw them at this and expect them to, to, to uh, be successful. And those that are highly motivated, they don't need much support. Those that are not, they need a lot of support. So again, um trying to read between the lines here. We're really saying that we have a, a the learner profile varies. You've got the highly self-regulated, then you need the, the highly dependent students. Um, and whether you're in a brick and mortar class or online, you have to adapt your practice and pedagogy to meet that. Um, does online learning offer more opportunities for personalization, do you think? Or, or not necessarily? I'm going to argue absolutely, and that's why I would argue every teacher should be using some level of digital components that are available to them for uh, students to interact, because it can be simple and personal inquiry-based. 
it can be more self-paced. So you, you only get them in the classroom. And when I was teaching in secondary, I was like, sometimes I only saw them three times a week for an hour. And by the time you get up through all the riffraff and bump and everything else, and then you deal with all the socialization and all the nattering and everything else, you really don't have much learning moments or nuggets in that period of time. Whereas online, all of that is behind. So the student is just focused on what's happening with you or with what you've created for them. So I think that it has a different pace and cadence. It has a greater opportunity to connect if properly structured, but not outside of the what's required in terms of the social physical connections that come in terms of learning in a regular environment where we're all together physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, do you want to add? The opposite view, to be honest with you, just be, I, I would go with your not necessarily answer, Michael, and, and I would actually use Randy's exact answer to, to justify that. You know, he said it can do this and it can do that and it could do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it does. Um, you know, I've seen classroom teachers that have incorporated technology and others that really have no technology involved that have really personalized their classrooms. I've seen folks online that have used it basically as a way to do direct instruction and really turned their online classes into, for lack of a better descriptor, glorified correspondence courses, mm -hmm. um, just using the online as a medium instead of the postal mail. And, you know, so while it has the opportunity to, it doesn't necessarily automatically mean that it does. And, and in much the same way that, you know, there are some classroom teachers that use these tools in really wonderful and, and, and creative ways. So it has the potential, but, <laughs> and, and dot, dot, dot. Okay, Carolina. Well, we have a, actually, we have a, a comment uh, that we just received from one of our online teachers. Uh, who teaches uh, students online and in reply to this um, the recent uh, well the, pre the the present question we've had a few learners from whom the online asynchronous model worked much better for various reasons than face-to-face -face. well michael it's a little bit like what the um students we had last week on our episode saying that online is working much better for them than a face-to-face -face environment in classroom so like you mentioned it, it really depends on the learner and their profile and and I also think that the teacher plays a monstrous role here in, in, in creating that environment, that setting that, that's conducive to learning and engagement. And they, they were highly, um, they were engaged in a lot of project-based learning as well and, and working in groups. Michael? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, that speaks to, you know, is, is the nature of students. You know, I mean, I think back to myself when I was a, a student, you know, I was the one that didn't mind you know, participating in class and didn't mind being the center of attention in, in an academic setting. You have others that really sort of, you know, want to remain anonymous in a classroom. And in the online environment, they're able to engage directly with the teacher without other students knowing that. So it provides that sort of sense of, of um, invisibility, if you will, in terms of your peers. And, you know, so it, it, a lot of it, man, you know, manages the, the affordances that the medium provides compared mm -hmm. with the challenges. Mm -hmm. And it's going to afford certain students certain things, whereas the classroom is going to afford other students different things. That, that's, that anonymity can help us become a little braver than we might normally be in a, in a, in a but, situation but, where, where the, the cute girls behind me and I, I don't want to put my hand up because <laughs> I so, didn't get it. <laughs> I, I want to jump in at the end. My apologies about the zoning out or uh, technology, uh, internet. Um, but I think that that's important. But I think both uh, environments need to be examined and considered. That, that was my ultimate point. So we received another comment, Michael. Um, a teacher shares with us, um, students in my district all were issued a Chromebook that they would use from warm-ups and had just learned how to research before schools were shut down. Thank you for that comment, uh, Sarah. Um, we want to go on to our next question, question number six. We're pressed for time, so yeah, let's move ahead. Yeah, so before COVID-19, what trends were happening across Canada in the field of e-learning? Well, again, I think we've had a long history of, uh, of uh, distance education in Canada. And uh, uh, did you guys pick up any trends or directions in, in the uh, online education generally across Canada or maybe elsewhere? Um, 
I'll start and Randy can jump in afterwards, but probably the biggest trend that I've noticed over, you know, when I look at the 13 years that we've been doing that state of the nation, something that's really happened in the last three to five years is that ministries and departments of education across the country have just seemed to have a little bit more interest in, in what's happening here. Um, in some cases, that interest has been trying to figure out what's going on on the ground so that they can, you know, develop policy in the future. In some cases, it's trying to figure out, you know, how it should be funded or regulated. In some cases, it's trying to um, create some sort of um, political agenda around what's happening in, in the distance learning space. But in all cases, it's, it's, they seem to have a great, greater interest. And, and I can say that I would at least say two thirds of the provinces and territories in Canada have had this sort of the, this much greater focus upon um, what's going on. Now I noticed Randy's been having technical difficulties and he said he's gonna start texting his response here. So the trend that he has mentioned that he's seen a lot more of is a, a greater focus and emphasis on blended learning. And, um, you know, looking at, you know, Randy, uh, is located in British Columbia. I know he does a lot of work in Alberta and, and Ontario where Can You Learn probably has its, its, its you know, those three provinces are, are where the majority of the Can You Learn's members and activities are. Um, I can say that we've seen a great deal of activity in those jurisdictions. Um, you know, the, the Blend Ed conferences that have been going now for, I think this is going to be the fourth or fifth year in Alberta. Uh, that uh, we've Candy Learn's been partnered with. There's a Blend Ed BC group now um, with the um, the centralized systems that we've got in Ontario. You've seen a goal that they wanted to have 25% of all instruction in the province that be blended by, and I can't remember what the date was when they made that announcement five or six years ago. Um, you know, so. I agree with Randy that that's another trend that we're starting to see happen. And I know you've been seeing it in, in your own work with Learn, Michael, with a lot more of the schools that are, are, are using your resources in their schooling um, side of things. So um, I, I think Randy's probably hit the nail on the head with that one. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, we're pressed for time. I'd like to get to the last two questions because I think they're particularly interesting. They're all yeah. interesting. But we do have a comment that just came in, Michael, yeah, um, for the fifth question that we had about the research and the students. Uh, to be successful in an online environment, students need parents and teachers who will work with them, help them, and support them. So basically collaboration. I mean, it's, 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 it's everyone, right? Everyone involved in school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Perfect. So let's go down to our, um, our next question, which is question number seven. Uh, we've seen mandatory e-learning in some U.S. states for some time now. Ontario has done the same. Why did this happen? And it, it is, is it going to be a, a trend? Um, well, I'll try to answer it quickly, knowing that we've got a couple more questions. Um, there are six states in the U.S. right now that require some form of online learning. That's actually down. At one point, there was almost a dozen. Um, so we've seen a number of states that have pulled back from it. Um, in the case of Ontario, I, I'm sure there are folks who might watch this from Ontario that would assign motivation to the current government as to why they looked at doing it. Uh, their stated motivation um, publicly has been the fact that today's student will be learning in an online fashion at the post-secondary level. Um, a lot of their workplace training that they'll be doing in their future careers will be online. So let's provide them in a more supported and mediated environment and experience and opportunity to learn online while they're still in the K-12 system so they can develop those skills. I will tell you that there is no research that supports that position. In fact, the only research that has been done actually found the exact opposite. Um, folks at the, it was a single study done at one university where they looked at online students to see um, their efficacy towards their online learning uh, as well as their uh, performance and based upon whether or not they had experience learning online at the high school level or not. And the students that had no experience learning online had a much greater efficacy towards themselves as online learners than those that did. Um, it's something I've heard a lot of ministries ask me about over the years. 
um, across Canada, but um, other than Ontario, no one else has really explored it much other than asking, you know, about how it works in the U.S. and if I've heard any other Canadian jurisdictions that want to do it. Michael, uh, more cynical amongst us might think or suggest that for some pl in some places, this is a cost-cutting measure that um, um, that the quality of education in their mind may suffer, but on um, the cost overall of operating education, we need fewer teachers. Um, if we package courses and send them out, we have a lot of big companies that just package them out and send them out. It's a lot less expensive than uh, having uh, regular full-time teachers. Um, again, without uh, putting you on the spot, do, do you suggest that maybe that's kind of what's happening in some places? <laughs> um, I would suggest it's part of it. I mean, in the U.S. jurisdictions, in all honesty, a lot of the, one of the things, and this goes to, I think, one of the later questions um, with the differences between Canada and the U.S., and it, we can sort of, I think it's the last question, tie it into here. One of the big differences is that the online learning movement in the U.S. has really gotten caught up in the school choice movement. And at its heart, the school choice movement is basically set on the idea that if you have competition in a public system, that is going to breed excellence. And I think all you've got to do is look at the U.S. healthcare system and compare it to the Canadian system, where they have a competitive profit driven system compared to ours and realize that that underpinning is just completely false. Um, so that profit motive and, and, and that cost cutting measure, I think, is something that is at the heart of a lot of these uh, that we've seen in the U.S. Um, I, I, not being a resident of Ontario, I wouldn't necessarily want to assign that motivation to the government of Ontario. Although it is interesting that um, when they did put out their original class size limits, that they had a, a class size for online classes that was 25% larger than the face-to-face -face class size. So just based upon that notice alone, you would be able to remove the more, for every online class you had, you would need 20% less teachers. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's it's, uh, maybe it's uh, hidden in there as a warning just to be on the on the watch for all these things that don't ascribe a, a devious <laughs> um, intent at, in certain places. Yeah. <laughs> One million dollars we're going to save. OK, um, Carolina, we have our last question. Yes, our last question. Uh, number eight. We hear a lot about uh, e-learning in other countries, particularly in the U.S., how does e-learning differ in Canada and why? And I guess that suggests that it does differ. It might be, might be the same as everywhere else. Yeah, the, the, the practice of it in terms of what actually happens at the, the, the ground level, at the teacher level, is, is quite consistent. Um, I'll say that it tends to be funded a little bit better in the U.S. than in Canada, but that's because in most cases it's funded through a the, the, the full-time equivalent. So, you know, if I've got a student that's taking one of my four courses with the online program, the online program actually gets a quarter of the, the funding, um, which is the model in, in British Columbia um, as well. One of the other differences uh, I'll point to is that uh, from a practical standpoint, um, there's a lot more online learning at the elementary level in the U.S., um, and that actually stems from a lot of their full-time students. So a lot of the cyber charter students tend to be at the elementary or middle school level, whereas that's very rarely an option in Canada. Um, only a couple of jurisdictions have much going on, you know, once you get lower than grade seven or eight. Um, and then beyond that sort of whole profit neoliberal school choice thing that we had just mentioned, uh, the only other thing I'd say is that Historically, and I say historically because the experience that we've had for the past year in Ontario has sort of gone in the other direction, but prior to what happened in Ontario for the past 12 months, um, unions in Canada have tended to be quite supportive of online learning. They've, you know, asked a lot of questions about and, and had some reservations about, you know, quality of life issues and what constitutes an equivalent workday for online folks compared to face-to-face -to -face folks. But for the most part, they've been very supportive. In some cases, actually come up very strongly fighting for distance learning opportunities in their, their jurisdictions. Whereas in the U.S., unions have tended to be very against 
online learning. And that's probably, again, partly because of that whole school choice, neoliberal, privatizing public education kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I wish we had more time. I mean, I, I, we've run out of time now. We've used up our hour because I, I have many, many more questions. And I really want to thank you, Michael and Randy. I, I think you can hear me here, but uh, I really want to express my appreciation for this. Uh, it was very in, in, insightful and informative for us. So thank you so much. Uh, Carolina, do you want to close out? Yes. Uh, well, this wraps up our series of our Twitter chat on in e-learning. We'd like to thank everyone who's participated into our, in our Twitter chat, all our followers, our viewers, all, everybody that participated and, and, and replied to our questions in the last couple of weeks, the last four weeks. Uh, thank you to all our guests. We so are happy that we were part of this uh, series. So um, thank you to our virtual campus team, our online teachers, uh, the parents that were here last week, um, the students, of course, and thank you uh, to our guests that were here today, Randy and Michael. And uh, thank you, Rob, for uh, being with us in the last couple of weeks, uh, for our technical producer, to make sure that everything uh, works well uh, tech-wise. Uh, tech and of course, thank you to our moderator, Dr. Michael Canyol, CEO of LEARN. Thanks everybody for tuning in and um, just want to remind everybody that these um, series are have been recorded so there's be up live they're actually live on our uh, fa uh, Facebook page so you could go and uh, view them there and they will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel in the next uh, week or so so you'll be able to view them on our YouTube as well. Thank you everybody. Take care. Have Bye, a great everyone. summer. Thank Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you Randy. Thank you Michael.